Now that we've computed within the model of Poisson, the probability of convicting an accused, our next question, and the fundamental question, of course, is what are the chances of an erroneous conviction or an erroneous acquittal? So let's start first with the probability of an erroneous conviction. What does this mean? Well, let's transcribe this in words. It means an individual is innocent and is convicted. And therefore, what we're looking for is to write down the probability of innocence conditioned upon the occurrence of the event that the individual is convicted. An atavistic target memory might suggest that this kind of conditioning probability argument is familiar. This is related via Bayes' rule to a change in the direction of conditioning. And the moment we write it in this form, it all falls into place. The denominator is the probability that the individual is convicted, and we've just by dint of some effort, by using additivity, computed this in closed form in the expression on the upper right. In the numerator, is the term which corresponds to conviction if the individual is innocent. And this is exactly the second of the two terms which, is, which comprises the sum for the probability of conviction. And so in one fell swoop, we can simply write down the answer. The second term for innocence divided by the probability of conviction. The listener should take a moment to write it down and think about it and make sure she has absorbed it. The expression looks algebraically formidable, to be sure, but the logic by this point should be completely transparent. And as a test of your understanding, it would be a good idea to ask whether you can now retrace the steps and write down an expression for the probability of an erroneous acquittal. Pause the lecture, take a moment, and see if you can just follow through and see what the answer might be. Restart the lecture, of course, when you're ready. So, by an entirely similar process, an erroneous acquittal means that the individual is guilty but has been acquitted. And so we're asking for the probability of guilt conditioned upon acquittal. This is an a posteriori probability, a probability after the fact. And following exactly the same line of argument, we write it through and we find an expression very similar. In fact, it's a mirror image of the expression above. At this point, now we've got the two fundamental drivers of errors in the jury verdict process. The, the probability of an erroneous conviction on one hand and the probability of an erroneous acquittal on the other. Of course, the balance between these is going to depend upon societal sensibilities. What at a given time in a given society is felt to be more important of the two. But clearly, we would like both of these to be small, but the relative proportions, as I've mentioned, depends. But there's still a block here. How in these expressions, does one actually compute them? We do not know theta and p a priori. And how do we actually determine theta and p? Remember, theta, the probability of guilt, is a parameter of the model. We don't know this a priori. p, the probability that a juror in a particular veneer, a particular uh, group of potential jurors, makes errors. Hopefully, theta is bigger than half, at least in a tranquil and stable society. Hopefully, p is less than half, hopefully much less than one half, in a well-chosen jury system. But how does one actually determine these parameters? Now, to understand this, we now need some more data. And so let's go back to Poisson's data. In the years 1825 to 1830, the outcomes of jury trials were available. And this is an abbreviated list. The original list actually had more detail. It had additional information about whether the accused was for a crime against a person or for a crime against property and so on. 
But here is a compacted list. It shows the number of accused in the years between 1825 to 1830, when jury trials comprised 12 individuals, with a majority of at least seven being needed to convict. And here's the number of convictions by year. Using this as, a, as data, we can go back to the models and try to estimate the parameters theta and p. An objection immediately arises because you'll realize we have binomial probabilities. So we have powers of p. And that's going to make these calculations difficult. Poisson found ingenious ways of simplifying calculations and found out, and he, as he noted, there was a remarkable stability across these years in terms of conviction rates, in terms of, in terms of the probabilities of guilt. And Poisson estimated from these data that theta was about 0.64, that about two-thirds of individuals who were accused were actually guilty, while P was about 1 in 4. The probability that a juror makes mistakes is 1 in 4. Three out of four times a juror makes correct decisions. So we have now at least in principle a way forward. We've got a formal model. If one has data, then one can go back to the data and estimate parameters of the model. And then we can use that model to test new data. This sounds promising and good. Of course, I've left out details here. In those years in France, between 1825 to 1830, if a jury had a majority of seven for conviction, then the case actually went to a higher court, which would again examine the data and then come out with a decision and possibly overturn the original decision. Poisson actually cleverly used such cases to provide secondary checks on his estimates. Following 1830, between the years 1831-1833, France moved to a 12-member jury system where now it, a majority of eight was needed to convict. And of course, there were data for that as well, and Poisson analyzed that data as well. All of this suggests that there's a principled methodology here where one can set up the probabilities of error in jury verdicts the question now, of course, is what is the proper size of jury and what supermajority does one need? What is optimal? And so to do this, we want to promptly generalize what we have. So here are the expressions we've computed. The probability of erroneous conviction when you have a jury of size 12 with a majority of seven needed for conviction, and the probability of erroneous acquittal. Suppose now we abstract the problem and we say, Suppose we have a jury of n individuals, y n, because it is inconceivable that I use anything else for an algebraic variable. And suppose we need a majority, let's say m individuals, to convict. In our example from France, from 1825 to 1830, n was 12 and m was 7. How do these expressions change? All we need to do is go in and strike out sundry references to 12 by n and sundry references to 5 or 12 minus 7 by n minus m. And that's all there is to it. Bob's your uncle. And so our first expression becomes an apparently more complicated expression involving n and m. Our second expression, again, replacing 12 by n and 5 by n minus m becomes this. And there you have it. We now have a formal model. Now, testing such models is difficult. And perhaps it's a sad commentary on the rate at which society progresses that in late 20th century America, the amount of data, the type of data available, was not really very different from what was available in 19th century France. So in the intervening period of about 150 years, we still have essentially the same kind of system and the same kind of data. Very little further progress actually has been made. So perhaps this is a commentary on the evolution of society in time. Now we can use this as a starting point to analyze jury systems and jury verdicts. But our purposes here are slightly different. 
For our purposes, this problem of jury selection and the validity of jury verdicts, the justice of jury verdicts, was useful in establishing a context. The story was nice and colorful to be sure. It allowed us to re-examine the binomial distribution in a meaty context and to resurrect ideas from independence and conditional probability and which allowed us to get a clean review of these principles. Let us leave this for the time being and move on because at heart here is now a new question. The binomial probabilities ineluctably get folded into these expressions. How does one actually evaluate these probabilities? How does one evaluate such sums even if one knows the parameters? This leads or led to a discovery Poisson made in 1837 and that is the subject of our next mini lecture and the subject of the star blue as a whole.